start with a prayer. Again, if we could get our, our Native American brothers and sisters up here. We're going to start with a prayer and Pastor Paul. Where's Pastor Paul? So if we could get Pastor Paul up here. Let's get our Native American brothers and sisters up here. We're going to start it with a prayer. We're going to honor our country then. We're, we're, after that, we'll do the pledge and we'll do the anthem. And then we'll get started with our program. So, Pastor Paul, right here. All right, guys, thank you so much. That's a beautiful, beautiful march. I want to tell you something. There's something that's very important for you all to understand. When we began this in February, there was 20 of us. Then that 20 became 50, and then that 50 became 100, and today we have hundreds. <laughs> Next month, it's going to be thousands. And before you know it, there's going to be millions, because we're starting a movement to change the consciousness of our country. And Laredo is where it's going to be led because of you. Thank you so much. Hami Daki Api, Chante Washtene Api, Jews Api, Wania Machi Api. We're going to pray in our name, our language. Like I said, there is a congressional act to actually do away with our language. And so I'm really humbled that I get to share our language and our prayers and our steadfastness and our solidarity with you and really becoming good relatives to each other because we are indigenous people and this is our land and we are here in solidarity to show you support and to show you no fear. Na Daya we chose any Dayan Zania. Na Tungashila wa Kunka Wopila Tunka Chichia Hi Tungashila Tigitiape na Ushila Hikte. Hari Dakyasi. Thank you, Anita. Let's pray. Oremos. Padre Santo, we thank you for the Martin Luther King Day, for the legacy of Dr. King and many, many thousands of people whose names we don't even know, who have sacrificed over and over. Thank you for the people from Standing Rock and other parts of the country who've come to join us to show that we can fight against oppression. We pray that you would bless this effort, not just here, but all over the country. Padre Santo, te damos gracias por este día de Martin Luther King, por el testimonio que él y muchos otros dieron y el sacrificio que hicieron para renovar y reconciliar la injusticia en este, en este país. We do pray, God, that justice will prevail. As Isaiah said, let justice roll down like a stream and righteousness. Let it flow upon us and let it flow upon our land and bring healing and grace and give us strength to persevere. Ayúdanos a seguir adelante 
de no rendir, pero seguir adelante, pidiéndote a ti justicia, misericordia, y ayudándonos a reconciliar no solo esta parte del mundo, pero todo el mundo. We ask for reconciliation among all peoples and healing among all nations. All this we pray again in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Paul. And now to do the pledge for our country, we have a veteran, Bobo Gonzalez, will lead us in the pledge, and then we'll do the anthem, and we can all do it together. If you could please rise. Could y'all please stand? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Everybody, on this national day of service honoring Dr. Martin Luther King, a giant in our history who fought against oppression, who fought against injustice, who fought against racial hatred and animosity, and he showed us the way of peaceful, nonviolent protest. And we walk in those steps of Dr. King today. And thank you for being here. We want to thank the city of Laredo for sponsoring this event with our coalition. We thank Councilman Mercurio Martinez and Councilwoman Nelly Vielma to be here to show the city of Laredo's support behind this movement. Thank you. We have for our first speaker today, um, we have Dr. Horacio Salinas. He's a professor of history and the Dean of Arts and Sciences at Laredo College to share a few words. Let's welcome Dr. Salinas. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As Laredoans, citizens of this great country, visitors from distant lands, all men and women of goodwill, we celebrate the life and achievements of Dr. Martin Luther King. We recall his legacy as a champion of civil rights and his dream to transform the country into an oasis of freedom and justice. His words and actions inspire us to struggle for justice and compassion in light of our current political situation. We are witnessing the erection of a border wall, a physical barrier, ostensibly designed for the purpose of security, but in fact, reflects the anxieties and fears of a nation that has lost its way. The wall is a manifestation of the divisions facing this country. After the 2016 presidential election, a Gallup poll found that 77% of Americans 
saw the country as greatly divided when it comes to the most important values. And the rise of the negative effects of social media and the decline of our institutions have poisoned the wells of our public discourse. Now, a cursory look at our history shows that divisions are not new. Think of the Civil War, Vietnam, the fight for civil rights, and the culture wars. But what is new today is the rise of a virulent populism that denies not only the patriotism, but the humanity of those it disagrees with. And the champions of this populism are found at the highest level of our government, who weaponize divisions for political and financial gain. We have entered in what journalist Carl, Carl Bernstein says is a cold civil war where the growing distrust of facts, objective journalism, leave us to adhere to false narratives that cater to our existing political beliefs. It has become difficult to have a national conversation based on shared facts and the direction of our body politic is one of fracture and disintegration. Given the current state of affairs, what does Dr. King teach us about the efficacy of erecting a wall here at the southern border? We don't usually associate him with immigration in his fight for justice, but we can turn to his speeches and note his likely position. On September 13, 1964, King visited Berlin during the height of the Cold War. He was invited by Mayor Willy Brandt to address some 20,000 citizens of West Berlin during its 14th annual cultural festival. While there, he heard the news about a young man from East Berlin who was shot attempting to escaped to the West by scaling the Berlin Wall. The infamous wall had become a symbol of the Cold War and the ideological divide between communism and democracy. At the news, King requested to visit the wall. U.S. authorities were reluctant and took away his passport. Undeterred, he not only visited the wall, but was allowed to pass into East Berlin through Checkpoint Charlie using his credit card for identification. He arrived at St. Mary's Church and addressed an overflowing audience. King's speech dwelt on the absurdity of the wall. He said, no man-made barrier can obliterate the fact that God's children reside on both sides. There is no east, no west, north, no south, no north, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide world. He went on to say, and I think here he would stand with immigrants and refugees, that men and women search for meaning, hope for fulfillment, yearn for faith in something beyond themselves, and cry desperately for love and community to support them in this pilgrim journey. King then recounted how in the United States there was a great social revolution taking place based on the principles of Christian love and nonviolence. Sparked by the disobedience of Rosa Parks who refused to give up her seat, the civil rights movement was a struggle to free millions of African Americans from the evils of segregation and discrimination. While King was not explicitly suggesting that East Berliners take up the cause to resist their oppressors, he perhaps implicitly encouraged the possibility of mass mobilization based on a foundation of human dignity. I have not been here long enough to discern God's plan for you, he said. However, I would like to share with you the way in which the Spirit moves in our midst in the freedom struggle. Today's opponents of the wall can draw from King's words. If the government succeeds in its construction, the judgment of history will declare it as a wall of shame a period when the country allowed its fears to betray the principles of democracy. We must fight for alternative solutions to the problems of immigration while sustaining the very best of our values. An enduring lesson from the legacy of Dr. King is his assertion that we can no longer afford to worship the God of hate. He exhorts us to have faith, and with this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. May his words and deeds inspire us to respond to the Spirit's calling to perform courageous acts of conscience, 
that recognizes our common shared humanity and that engages in the process of tearing down the barriers and walls of our disunion. Thank you. Next, we want to bring up our brothers and sisters to come up together in solidarity with us. Y'all can all come up together. We have in solidarity with us today people who traveled, our Native American brothers and sisters from the Standing Rock Reservation in South Dakota, the Pine Ridge Reservation. We've got people from the Come Crudo tribe in the valley. We have uh, Arthur Red Cloud Park Navajo Lakota in Dallas. And and we've got people from the Cheyenne Nation. And we reached out to the people of Standing Rock. As you know, this exploded onto the national and global scene in 2016 because of injustices that they were facing, like us, a project that came into their lands that was gonna affect their only source of drinking water, the Missouri River, ours is the Rio Grande. But they also had problems, and they still do, with the Army Corps of Engineers suspending studies, not talking to their tribes, not talking to their people, cutting these big oil pipelines through their sacred sites and their source of drinking water. And because they rose up, they rose up, they started with three, and they rose to 25,000. They rose to 25,000. And they're here to, to tell us their story, and they're here to teach us what we can learn in a very difficult, challenging battle that's before us and that will unfold this year. So I would like to introduce from the Lakota tribe, Wania Locke and Montgomery Brown. Thank you for coming out today. I just want you all to give yourselves a round of applause for coming out today. I am 28 years old. I'm from the Sandy Rock Sea Reservation. I live in Juan Pollock, South Dakota. I'd just like to share a few thoughts with you today. Um, where are all my youth? Where's all my high school kids? Make some noise. You guys are awesome. Thank you for coming out. Uh, part of the message I would like to share from you, some of the lessons from Standing Rock, is we need our youth to step up and become more involved. If you look up here on this podium, and this is no disrespect to anybody up here, but I'm probably the only person who's of a younger age that's actually up here. Oh, I got another one. I don't feel so alone. Now, we need youth to step up. We need them to help shape the future. Black Lives Matter, Palestine, and numerous movements around the world are being youth-led by kids in, by kids in middle school, high school, and even at the college level. We repeatedly say the children are our future, but seldom make space for them to share their voices. I say this in good spirits because there is hope, as you're all witnessing here today from all the youth that came out. Our struggles are your struggles. Where I come from, every single one of these kids ex looks exactly like the kids back home. So being here in Laredo, which is 95% Hispanic, I really feel at home and I really feel at peace being among all of you today. Now, I, since it's MLK Day, I kind of Googled some of his, uh, his writings this morning and there's something I'd like to share with you. And Dr. King said, Fear is a powerful creative force. The fear of ignorance leads to education, etc. Every saving invention and every intellectual advance has behind it, as a part of its motivation, the desire to avoid or escape some dreaded thing. And so Angelo Petri is right in saying education consists in being afraid at the right time. Now when I say that, it's a big step for people to step up, to oppose something, to stand up for what's right. And all of you coming here are great examples of overcoming fear. And I applaud you all for that. Thank you for having the courage. Thank you for having the strength. Thank you for having the determination to stick out the march, even though maybe we did have a few people who are on the opposite side. But with that being said, 
I would like to once again thank you for having all the youth. The banners are amazing. Thank you guys for welcoming me so graciously into your neighborhood. So on Martin Luther King Day, you know, silence is the enemy. And Martin Luther King said that you will not remember the hateful words of your enemy, but you remember the silence of your friends. And that's why we're here is to amplify each other's voices, to amplify our oppression and saying no more, saying that we are indigenous people of this land and we stand united. And we're no longer going to be silent and no longer have no consultation and no meaningful dialogue, no more. So the first act that Trump, when he was in administration, within 24 hours of his administration, he directly impacted our community. He pushed forward the Dakota Access Pipeline and the KXL Pipeline, which was vetoed by Obama. So that is now another pipeline that we are fighting to keep off our homelands from destroying and desecrating our graves, our homes, our land, and our water. So we're currently fighting two, two pipelines within the state of South Dakota. We're also facing uranium and gold, fracking. We also face human trafficking. We face drug trafficking. The oppression is the same, but it's literally on our shoulders to stand united. And we have great leaders like Martin Luther King that have led the way that paved the hardest road ever. And we are so beneficial to walk upon this road that they have put steadfast and laid down. So with this, I stay with you guys all. No wall. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'd like to bring up uh, an educator who'd like to uh, give a prayer. And her name is Rosa Maria de Llano. Thank you, Trisha. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rosa Maria Ceballos de Llano. I was born in Nuevo Laredo, but have lived here all my adult life. I have crossed a Rio Grande thousands of times. No, maybe tens of thousands of times, because as a young girl, I came to school every day to Laredo and would go back. All my brothers and sisters still live there, and I visit, visit them often, even when there are warnings not to cross. I still go. This river is a sacred resource. How dare outsiders put a wall on its banks and endanger? A wall is an aberration to this ecosystem, to our way of life. This wall is a symbol of racism, hate, and division that we should not tolerate. But in honor of our Lakota brothers and sisters and in honor of all our indigenous people of the Americas, I have written a prayer to our sacred father, our great spirit, and I did my ancestry research, and I'm 21% Native American. Guerita, pero indígena también. I'm 21. I was so proud. Most Mexicanos are mestizos. And if you do your roots, you will find my children are 24% Native Americans, and they're very proud. So this is our prayer for my river, our river, the Rio Grande. Oh, great spirit, our father. Creator of all, we give thanks for a river, sacred water that nourishes all, quenches our thirst, cleanses our bodies, heals our wounds. This river is life to us all. Oh, great spirit, we need your strength and wisdom to protect our river, our great river, Rio Grande, our fierce river, Rio Bravo, a river with two names two sister cities, Laredo and Nuevo Laredo, of different nations, different languages, yet our history is the same. We come from the same people. We are one soul and we're one beating heart. Thanks to this river we share, we pray to the four winds that no border wall divide us, that no border wall prevents us from reaching its banks. Let, me, let my eyes behold the beauty of your landscape. Let me feel the soft mist that rises at dawn. Let me smell the mesquite and other flora that so richly abound. Let me see the roadrunners, the jackrabbits, deer drinking your water. Let me hear the songs of the mockingbirds, the green jays, and the doves. 
We pray to the west wind and bless the San Juan Mountains of Colorado where our river begins so pristine. We pray to the east wind and bless the Gulf of Mexico where it ends. We pray to the south and bless Mexico, the home of so many of our ancestors with whom this river we share. We pray to the north wind and bless the rest of the USA and pray they hear our plea. Respect our river so sacred, so dear. O oh, great spirit, our father, creative of all, let our leaders open their hearts and their minds and help them see how important this river is to us, our source of water, our livelihood. We ask, do not build a wall of concrete and steel that will damage our riverbank, our ecosystem so rich, so diverse, so fragile. We pray that no wall divide us from our ancestors' land, for we are one and the same. We are one soul. We are one beating heart. So let everyone know near and far here in Laredo we do not need, nor do we want, a border wall. No 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 border wall. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rosa. I'm about to uh, bring up our next speaker, but I want to share a brief story before I do. Do Dr. Jerry Thompson is going to come up in a minute. He is the preeminent historian of the city of Loretta. He's written many, many books detailing the history of this region. And so he, more than anyone, knows our story uh, in, in a very special way. And so his words are meaningful because of that. But before I bring him up here, I want to tell you about a trip I took in November to D.C. Trisha and several others from the Valley went up to D.C. to... Uh, advocate against the border wall and on the final day that I was there which was on Friday I went over to the Lincoln Memorial and that's on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial is where Martin Luther King gave his I have a dream speech and as I was walking up those steps there was three or four high school students who were wearing MAGA caps and they saw me and there was nothing about me that was said anything about the border wall I wasn't wearing any no border wall paraphernalia I wasn't wearing anything I was just dressed like my normal self. And as they saw me walking up the steps, two of them under their breath started to say, build a wall, build a wall. So it is wrong to believe that this wall is not racist. It is racist and it's racist for this reason, because it says that because of the color of your skin, you don't belong. And for those young men that day when they saw me and they saw the color of my skin, they said, you don't belong. You should be somewhere else, not here. So that border wall is a racist symbol. That's and right. it does mean racism. Right. I experienced it. March with you today. At my age, I'm happy to be anywhere. <laughs> uh, this is my 52nd year of higher education in Laredo. And I would like to present to you today an idea that seems most appropriate for the predicament we find ourselves in. We must first start by acknowledging that the country we live in today is not the America we saw eight years ago or 20 years ago, or 30 years ago. It is not the country that Americans died for in World War II, in a bloody civil war, or the America our founding fathers envisioned, or the country we want for our children and their children. I am old enough to remember all the way back to Harry Truman. There were presidents I did not like. Richard Nixon, who of course was the worst. I thought Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter were both weak but they were decent and moral and honest. Ronald Reagan was more a showman than a statesman, but I think his heart was probably in the right place. George Bush, number one, came into the White House as well qualified as almost any man in history and really messed up things big time. 
Bill Clinton was bright and articulate but could not keep his pants zipped <laughs> or his libido under control. George Bush number two was over his head from the beginning and had the misfortune of having one of the worst vice presidents in history. Barack Obama was bright and articulate and worked hard and brought hope and sanity but faced a badly divided nation. Then in 2016, the antiquated electoral college gave us Donald John Trump, although his opponent received three million more votes. I ask you today, is not Trump the worst president that this country has ever known? On any given day, Trump is vindictive, ignorant, narcissistic, and a fraud. Objective observers now him have him now at slightly over 15,000 lives. Even Richard Nixon had a sense of our place in the world community and stood up to tyrants. Trump does not even understand basic world geography, can't pronounce the name of several African and Asian countries, and could not locate them on a map, did not know that North Korea has a border with China or China has a long border with India. With the blessings of Vladimir Putin of Russia, he has worked hard to destroy NATO, one of the most effective diplomatic and military alliances ever created, an alliance that has held off Russian aggression for 70 years. Here is a president who lies several times a day and gives wealthy Americans a giant tax while consistently squeezing the middle class deals in absurd infantile conspiracies he hears on Fox News and denies climate change. If you think the world's climate has not reached a crisis point, go to Australia. Go to Australia, Trump, and tell that to the estimated 10,000 koalas, an estimated billion animals that have died in the wildfires. Here is a president that has turned back environmental rules and regulations on simple things such as clean air and clean water that have been in place for decades. Here is a president that appeals to the worst instincts of prejudice and ignorant and misguided people, especially those who are caught up in the anti-immigration hysterics and cheer the draconian immigration and deportation policies of Trump. What is more frightening is that when Trump flies his hate flag, his followers have stood and saluted. Here is a president who falls in love, and these are his words with some of the worst tyrants and dictators the world has ever known, while shunning our traditional allies and some of the world's great democracies. Here is a president who grabs, take, takes pleasure in grabbing women's private parts and brags about it. Here is a president who refers to Mexicans as rapists and murderers, says the entire city of Baltimore is rat infested, hates California, says all kinds of nasty things about Chicago, calls several countries in Latin America and Africa shithole nations, wants to build a wall along the Colorado border. Uh, my good friends in New Mexico find that really funny uh, to keep the Mexicans out. What he, when he once came to Laredo, he was afraid to get out of the limousine. If you don't believe that, ask the mayor. And here is a president who separates immigrant families and puts children in cages as if they were animals. I ask you, does not this immoral and corrupt man deserve removal from office? Yes. My God, hundreds of years from now, will not those who write our history not look back and see us as barbarians? Have we not completely lost the moral high ground? What can we do and what must we do? First, we must vote in November. We must ask our relatives to vote. We must ask our neighbors to vote. We must ask anyone we know to vote. I will vote for Bernie Sanders. I will vote for Elizabeth Warren. I will vote for Mayor Pete. I will vote for Michael Bloomberg. I will vote for Joe Biden. I will vote for Andrew Young. I will vote for Amy Klobuchar, Tom Steyer. I will vote for anyone except Trump. If there, were, if, there were, if there were three people left in the world, myself, Donald Trump, and a drunk gorilla, I would vote for the drunk gorilla. <laughs> oh, 
allow me to recommend a strong dose of Henry David Thoreau, one of America's great original thinkers, perhaps best remembered for his book Walden. Perhaps more significantly, Thoreau wrote an essay called Civil Disobedience, in which he argued that if you think your no government is doing something you think is morally wrong, you have an obligation to do something about it. But at all times, you must be nonviolent. Two things drove Thoreau crazy. The inhuman institution of slavery that lay, as it was said, coiled up under the table at the Constitutional Convention in 1787 and was ripping at the very soul of the nation at the time Thoreau wrote his essay. And the war with Mexico that Thoreau fought little more than naked aggression and an attempt to grab territory. When Martin Luther King was a young student at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, he read Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience for the first time and said that he was so impressed that he went back to his dorm room that night and reread it several times. Reading that essay changed his life in the landscape of American history. Mahatma Gandhi, that little brown man in a loincloth and sandals, who owned little more than a spinning wheel and a pair of glasses, and who brought the British Empire to its knees, carried a copy of Thoreau's essay with him in his pocket for much of his life, and this became the basic tenets of civil disobedience and nonviolence. If Martin Luther King can end the evil institution of racial segregation, and Gandhi can lead what is today the world's largest democracy to independence, we can, if we unite, and I ask you, stop a stupid wall. It would take Tricia Cortez's organization skills and it would take a lot of guts. But if several thousand people agreed to sit down in front of the surveyors or bulldozers or construction workers, there are not enough Border Patrol, Webb County Sheriff's deputies or DPS officers. <laughs> to arrest us all. If one man can stop tanks in Tiananmen Square, cannot a thousand Laredo and stop a wall? <laughs> we could send a powerful message to Trump and his minions. Think about it. Perhaps we can learn from our Lakota brothers and sisters and their long fight against the Lakota Access Pipeline. Has the time not come to stand up? to stand up and say, we do not want a wall through our backyards, through state and national parks, across ranches, and bird sanctuaries, and pristine landscapes. A young man once went up to the former slave and great abolitionist Frederick Douglass, who by the way Trump thought was a contemporary civil rights leader, <laughs> and asked Douglass what he should do with the rest of his life. Agitate, 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 Douglass responded. I say to you today, agitate, agitate, agitate. Enough is enough. Resist. Or into, where's your sign? Hold it high. Resist. <laughs> now is the time to stand up and be counted. What have we got to lose? Why not? Do we not want to be remembered for sitting home, drinking beer, and watching the Dallas Cowboys? Or do we want to be remembered for helping determine the destinies of those who will walk this plaza long after we have gone. Think about it. <laughs> Thompson, we are all going to be impacted by this wall because this represents one of the greatest land grabs by the government on the border of our public lands and our private lands. And here to represent the voice of those landowners whose ranches 
and porciones have been in their family for generations. Let's bring, we want to welcome the Medina family that is being represented by Ileana Medina Chandarles. So I'm here speaking on behalf of my family. My name is Ileana Medina Chandarles. I am the daughter of Antonia, Antonio and Ophelia Medina. And our family is only one of the many families in Webb County and Zapata, Zapata County who have been approached by U.S. Customs and Border Protection, who are asking for a right of entry for the purpose of surveying and site assessment in anticipation of the construction of a border wall. We are opposed to the concept of a wall for many reasons, ranging from our cultural roots to the wanton disregard of an environmental impact statement, which would certainly result in findings of ecological and environmental disaster along the entire path of what is already an environmentally sensitive and fragile water source on the southwest boundary of the state of Texas. Several years ago, on June 16, 2015, to be precise, a real estate developer and former television host announced his campaign for the presidency of the United States. That is when the current president, whom former White House chief of staff called an idiot, whom former Secretary of State Rex Tillerson called a moron, and whom Omarosa Manigault Newman, former member of the West Wing staff, called a bigot and a racist, first announced his plan to build a wall along the entire length of the United States-Mexico border, a distance of approximately 1,954 miles. He added flame to the fire by stating, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best, he said. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems to us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They are rapists. And some, I assume, are good people. He further stated that I will build a great wall, and nobody builds wall walls better than me, believe me. And I'll build it very inexpensively. I will build a great, great wall on the southern border, and I will make Mexico pay for that wall. Mark my words. <laughs> Trump continued with this racist rhetoric from that initial announcement throughout his campaign onto the present day. And he will undoubtedly continue to spout this foul vitriol forever. All of his vicious attacks on Hispanic people are solely for his be benefit as Putin's puppet attempts to rile up his equally rabid racist base with his white supremacist ideology. Trump, with frightening regularity, uses this call for a wall and routinely receives a rousing response from the crowds who form his base to reinforce his promise to build this wall and vilify immigrants from Mexico and Central and South America. I am proud to state that seven of my eight great-grandparents were born in Mexico. They arrived in the United States in late 1910 and in 1911 as legal migrants who left Mexico at the start of the Mexico Revolution. All of these fine people went to have successful lives and careers in the United States and all of their offspring were born in the United States, and all are American citizens. I am an American citizen, as are my parents and all four of my above-mentioned and now dearly departed grandparents. I hope that this doesn't sound harsh, but I am thankful that my grandparents did not have to suffer late in their lives by having to listen to the racist rants of a raving, loudmouth lunatic who has a vicious habit of dis disparaging our people. My father was offended by anything that Trump said or did during his campaign, and he cannot believe to this day that such a vile person, one of very low moral ethics, and exhibiting such high degrees of narcissism, misogyny, xenophobia, and racism could have been elected to the office of the presidency of the United States. Trump's words, tweets, and actions were readily visible to anyone having to access to print media, television broadcasts or internet access. And my dad was in disbelief that some of his now former close friends, fellow Hispanics of Mexican descent, some of whom are lifetime members of the League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC for short, supported Trump's divisive policies in particular 
his disdain for anyone resembling a Mexican. <laughs> My father purchased a small tract of land out of Ranchitos for Los Minerales Annex in the late 1970s. I was born in 1979. I'm 40 years old right now, so in 1970. This tract is situated approximately 12 miles northwest of the center of the city of Laredo. The southerly boundary line of this tract is also the southerly boundary line of Porción 10 and the northerly boundary line of Porción 11 in Webb County, Texas. The westerly boundary line of this property is the center of the Santa Isabel Creek, a small tributary of the Rio Grande River that flows for approximately 33 miles in a southwesterly direction from its soar source to its mouth at its confluence with the Rio Grande River. The reason that I mentioned Porción 11 is that there exists a small strip of land between our tract and the actual water course of the Rio Grande River. The proposed location of a wall would not only encumber the southerly end of our tract in Porción 10, but the entirety of the tract that is situated in Porción 11 between our tract and the flow of water in the Rio Grande River. In mid-October, a U.S. Border Patrol ranch liaison agent and two people presumably employed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers went to my dad's home to hand deliver a cover letter which was dated October 15, 2019 and was printed on U.S. Custom and Borders Protection letterhead. They also provided him with three copies of a document entitled Right of Entry for Survey and Site Assessment. The instructions given to my dad were to read and review the documents and to keep one copy of the right of entry form and return two signed copies of the document to U.S. Custom and Border Protection within 15 days. These government agents told my dad that at this point in time, mid-October, so this was mid-October of 2019, there were, there were funds allotted for surveying and site assessment purposes, but as at that time, there were no funds for the actual construction of a border wall. So this is October, guys. He never intended to, nor did he sign and return the right of entry forms. And in the early part of December 2019, he received a certified mail envelope from U.S. Customs and Border Protection dated December 4th, 2019, stating, the U.S. government has an immediate need to enter our property. For the purpose of conducting environmental assessments, property surveys, appraisals, and any other search work which may be necessary and incidental to the government's assessment of the property, for possible acquisition and support of U.S. Customs and Border Protection's construction of border infrastructure authorized by Congress in the fiscal year 2019 appropriation and other funded tactical infrastructure projects. Sorry, that was a long sentence. Uh, since they had not received my dad's permission to access the property by December 2nd, 2019, they had determined that it will be necessary to file an action in federal court to allow them to enter the property for those purposes for a limited period of 12 months. The pleading is called a declaration of taking and complaint and condemnation. <laughs> On Monday, January 6, 2020, my father received a, call, a phone call from a gentleman named John Smith, who stated that he is an assistant U.S. attorney working out of the Corpus Christi, Texas office. Mr. Smith advised my dad that he was calling to discuss the right of entry into our tract, and he indicated that it might be wise to meet at our tract in order to discuss the matter in greater detail. Perhaps in an attempt to persuade my dad to sign the right of entry form and avoid the forthcoming federal court actions. Mr. Smith and one of his associates picked my dad up at his home on Wednesday, January 8, 2020, and they all drove out to the tract in Mr. Smith's government issued Jeep. Mr. Smith said that he has over 10 years of experience working on similar cases in the Rio Grande Valley and that he and his office were just now getting their feet wet in Webb and Zapata counties. My dad was aware of the fact that on December 10th, so we're going back to December, a federal judge in Texas had blocked the use of military funds for building the wall. He was not aware, however, that just 10 days later, Trump signed a spending bill with about $1.4 billion allotted for the wall. Ironically, on this Wednesday, January 8, 2020, the 5th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, based in New Orleans, granted a stay of the Texas judge's order, freeing approximately $3.6 billion of U.S. Defense Department funds for the wall. Mr. Smith must have been aware of this fact because he told my dad that there was now funding available for the construction 
of approximately 69 miles of wall in Webb and Zapata counties, extending from the Columbia Bridge on the north end all the way to near the Falcon Lake Dam on the south end, which is actually at least 86 miles or so if one measures the distance on mapping so software such as Google Earth. We have enjoyed the use of our small tract for over 40 years. Since my sister and I were infants, we have spent many days throughout our lifetimes participating in all kinds of activities on our warm, inviting, and peaceful plot of land, ranging from simple but wonderful carnesadas to canoeing and bird watching along stretches of the Rio Grande River. My grandfather owned a small tract immediately east of and adjoining our tract, and my family, our extended family, and many friends spent a lot of time on both of these tracks. My grandfather's tract had a two-story house on it, and we would often spend weekends enjoying the peaceful tranquility of the great outdoors on the site. Although our tract is small, we are fortunate to have observed many kinds of wildlife on it throughout the years, including beautiful, rare, colorful birds, rabbits, armadillos, skunks, raccoons, coyotes, and bobcats. When my dad first purchased the property, he and his friends saw evidence of beaver activity along the Banco Santa Isabel Creek. Although my dad never actually saw a beaver, there were a lot of cuttings typical beaver behavior, as well as a small brushy dam across the Santa Isabel Creek near the extension of the northerly property line of the tract. We've also seen deer tracks near the heavy brush along the edge of the creek, but since our tract was part of what was once a farming operation and is now occupied by many large industrial truck, trucking type facilities, there can't be too many deer and the few that may remain probably roam around mostly at night. Over the years, we have utilized the direct access that we have to the Santa Isabel Creek to launch canoes and then paddle downstream along the creek for about 150 yards to a point at which we enter the Rio Grande River. Now, the current in the river provides a good workout when you're paddling a canoe. It obviously takes a lot more effort to go upriver against the current, but it, but it is easily manageable and a very good exercise. The elevation of our tract is approximately 437 feet above main sea level at its easterly end and drops down to about 400 feet above main sea level at its westerly end at the edge of the Santa Isabel Creek. My father asked Mr. Smith a lot of questions about the feasibility of building a wall at the proposed location indicated on the map provided by the government. First of all, they are proposing to condemn a portion of the most easterly and highest part of our tract they would then continue in a southwesterly direction and condemn the entire tract in Porcion 11, build the wall across the mouth of the Santa Isabel Creek, and condemn the next tract to the southwest in order to keep the construction of the wall going. Mr. Smith admitted that in all of the years that he's worked on condemnation cases in the Rio Grande Valley, he has never had to deal with a stream as wide as the Santa Isabel Creek, which depending on the time of year and the flow volume in the Rio Grande River, may be over 100 feet wide. My dad told him that over the, the years, during periods of heavy rainfall in this area, that he has made many trips to observe, observe the flow in the Santa Isabel Creek at the bridge on FM 1472, better known as Mines Road. He has witnessed large volumes of water flowing under this structure many times, and it is not unusual to see a lot of debris floating along with the flow. He questioned Mr. Smith as how the government was gonna prevent this type of debris from damaging the wall structure and clogging up the flow of water, and he simply admitted that he did not exactly know how, but their engineers would figure it out. As to my dad's question about blocking off the creek and closing off access to the Rio Grande River for recreational use, he simply stated that sections of the wall in the Rio Grande Valley that affected irrigation canals along levees had gates, and that these gates could be opened by the landowners if they had to perform some type of work within affected areas. He simply did not know how it would be possible for recreation enthusiasts to be afforded with a similar type of avenue on a waterway as wide as the Santa Isabel Creek. He also admitted that the terrain on our tract, being a bluff approximately 35 above the level in the water in the river on the day of his visit, was also go going to be a challenging construction problem. In the meantime, my husband and I are gonna make the time to, to take my two young sons on several canoe trips along the creek and the river so that they will have the opportunity to enjoy the relaxing nature of this experience and remember it for the rest of their lives. It's, it really saddens me to think that due to the madness of a spiteful demagogue, 
my children will be prevented from enjoying many of the basic freedoms that I've had the opportunity to enjoy for almost 40 years. As for the wall, I think that all of us here have a much better idea of where Trump can shove his wall. And it is not on our property, nor on your property, nor across the Santa Isabel, or any other creek in the Webb County or Sabata County, Texas. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Ileana. Now we have a, a poem that uh, Mary Sue Galindo, she's also an English instructor, educator here in, in Laredo, at the, at the uh, Laredo College, uh, Mary Sue Galindo. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, this uh, uh, poem that I, I put together, it, uh, the ideas, uh, I wrote them down in 2016 as I watched the Republican National Convention. The rich man rants, we'll build a wall. Mouths frothing and foaming, a crowd gathered for a lynching. A good old boy pastime, except this time they in suits. Conservatives, they call themselves. Christians cloak themselves with religion, though Jesus would call them out. Love is the way. The white nationalist wishes to live in the house on the hill, sells his vote to the highest bidder, Russia, if you're listening. Spits on the little guy, Pees on women, shits on the sacred. White power is intoxicating. Another rich white man proclaims, no amnesty for illegals. Applause, hoots, whistles rumble through the crowd. They ignore fact and truth. No one is illegal. Worked up to a frenzy, guns ready because this is war. They're taking over the country. An old Southern voice resounds with privilege and Confederate pride to sound the alarm. Gather up the cavalry. Let's hunt down the murderers, rapists, and bad hombres. The new cavalry wears custom-made suits, gets the best health care, and gets to decide who gets to eat and who goes to bed hungry, decides who gets a living wage and who doesn't shut down the government when they don't get their way. At the top of the pecking order, they have decided health insurance will cover Viagra, but not birth control. Keep your legs cold, sluts. Women will earn 80 cents for every dollar a man makes. Your place is in the home, wench. Asylum seekers can't come in. There's no more room in the end. This is what America has become under the grand old party. Land of the rich, by the rich, for the rich. In God we trust, everyone else pays cash. No niggers, Mexicans, or fags allowed. Muslims, the new targets. I'm scared for the country, scared of killer cops who shoot unarmed men of color in the back and get acquitted. Scared of angry white men with guns who've been given a green light to take out brown people? Scared of these white nationalists advising the president, making policy, legislating hate. I'm scared enough to sign a petition, scared enough to vote and register voters, scared enough to march, stand up, and speak up to protect what is right and denounce what is not. Mr. President, your wall is not about security. It is nothing more than a monument to hate. And we will not allow it to infiltrate, desecrate, violate our community, our already endangered sacred river, our very psyche. Here's a news flash. Brown people aren't going to disappear. Our roots run deep in these Americas. 
we have always been here. Yes. The very idea of your wall has brought us together today to remind you what Jesus had to say. Love is the way. Thank you, Mary Sue, thank you. Guys, we're coming almost to the close to the end. We got about 20 more minutes and we will land this plane, I promise, okay? But we still have a few very important points to be made. Now, when this coalition began, and it's very important that if you haven't signed up to be a member of the coalition, that you do so before you leave. Because when we began the coalition, it was literally 20 people at the steps of city council uh, talking about uh, the border wall and the fact that we did not want that wall to be built. And we've been growing and we've been growing more and more every month, and that's what our movement is about. Now, here's one thing I want to tell you before I, I call up our next speakers. We have uh, Councilman Nelly Vielma and Councilman Merck Martinez, okay? We live across from Nuevo Laredo, which is a very dangerous city in Mexico, and yet the fact that we live across from them, we don't see that violence in this community. Yeah. And that is when we decided that the national emergency was not real. Because if it's not happening in Laredo, if Laredo is not a high crime rate, if Laredo does not have high homicides, then where is this national emergency? It makes no sense. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. And the two people that have been with us from the city from the very, very beginning are Nelly Vielma and Councilman Merck Martinez. And I want to give them an opportunity to address you and tell you their point of view on this story. Hola, Lanero. Me da gusto, gusto verlos aquí. Voy a hablar en español, aunque lo había escrito en inglés, pero voy a tratar de traducir. Uh, y me pongo dos cachuchas hoy. Como representante de la ciudad, tenemos también una resolución en contra de este muro. Y como abogada de migración, llevo ya más de 20 años abogando por las familias que vienen a hacer el sueño americano, a cumplir el sueño americano, por esos soñadores, por esas familias que vienen y luchan. Y yo creo que esto, uh, desde que vino Trump a visitar, yo fui con mi bandera mexicana a protestar y en ese tiempo era cuando había habido una ofensa contra el veterano Senator McCain. Había muchos veteranos en protesta, pero claro que fake news se hizo al revés y dijo que todas las banderas eran pro. Uh, pero lo que, lo que más me había molestado a mí era el haber dicho que todos los mexicanos que vienen, uh, que eran violadores y que eran uh, criminales, y claro que no, nosotros sabemos que nuestras familias que vinieron a, a crear a su familia aquí en, en Estados Unidos son familias luchadoras, son familias que vienen a trabajar, y lo que hemos visto es estas uh, tácticas discriminatorias. Todo lo que hemos visto de repente salen las noticias y siguen cambiando y siguen cambiando las reglas. Aunque el Congreso no ha cambiado la ley, siguen cambiando las reglas, los reglamentos, cómo hacer más difícil que, que una persona pueda tener sus documentos en este país. Y ve, vi por ahí, el asilo no es un crimen. Claro que no es un crimen. Vienen a pedir refugio. Si yo, como madre, estuviera en uno de estos países y sé que a mi, a mi hija desde la edad de 10 o 12, seguro que la van a violar. ¿Cómo que no voy a salirme de ese país? ¿Cómo que no la voy a proteger? Pues estamos aquí viendo las, las, las uh, prácticas discriminantes y, y también lo que estamos viendo es que este muro no es solo más que una promesa de campaña que está tratando de, de comprometer con nuestras taxas, ¿verdad? Y que es muy caro y está también un sacrificio a las familias militares que tanto necesitan este dinero y quitar este dinero del presupuesto nada más para una promesa de campaña no es correcto y debemos de estar en contra. Y me da mucho gusto lo que dijo Dr. Thompson, que es uno de mis you know, favorite profesores, porque si no nos movilizamos, ese tipo de disobedience, si no lo hacemos, si no hacemos un plantón, no nos van a escuchar. Lo mismo hoy, y todos los jóvenes que son más techy que nosotros, por favor, make it go viral. Share, 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 make it go viral. Porque muchas veces vamos a Washington y no nos oyen. Vamos a Washington y no escuchan cómo estamos viviendo nosotros en la frontera. Si somos el pueblo número uno en toda Latinoamérica, si todo los, los, uh, lo que pasa por aquí está manteniendo familias y negocios en Estados Unidos, ¿Cómo puede ser que vamos a cerrar la puerta? Como dijeron los tiros del norte, nos quitaron ocho estados y ahora también de Rivete nos vamos a cerrar la puerta. Claro que no. Somos hermanos, somos, tenemos nuestra familia, nuestra cultura, nuestros negocios y todo ese, ese uh, embrazo que tenemos con México 
no queremos que este muro lo cierre. Uh, una de las cosas, y traje por aquí en medio, no sé si todo está ahí la, la pintura, mi mamá me hizo esta pintura esta Navidad de mi regalo, y es una pintura que demuestra el muro, y está la mamá de un lado y el niño del otro lado. ¿Por qué? Porque por 20 años ella ha oído las historias de cómo muchas de las familias que he podido ayudar, cómo han batallado, cómo muchas veces se les están muriendo los papás, eh, eh, sus hijos o tienen cáncer o algo, y es muy difícil. No vemos ese lado, otro lado del de, de sueño americano, de venir acá a trabajar y muchas veces no poder a ver a sus familiares, ¿verdad? Y eso es, es algo que eh, ahorita también están los dreamers, en la campaña, ¿verdad?, que estamos esperando qué va a decidir la Corte Suprema para todos nuestros Dreamers. Esos Dreamers yo he representado eh, con doble maestría, son nuestros maestros, son, son nuestros uh, enfermeros, enfermeras, son los que están enseñando a tus hijos en la escuela, son los que nos cuidan en el hospital. Tengo también padres religiosos que son Dreamers. ¿Por qué? Porque vinieron aquí con ese sueño americano. No es su culpa que los hayan traído ilegalmente quizás, pero sí han logrado hacer algo muy positivo para nosotros y para nuestras familias. Y queremos que este sueño americano continúe vivo. Y vamos a pedir organizarnos, por favor se registran para hacer ese plantón. Y gracias a Trisha, Carlos, por organizar, porque eso es lo que necesitamos. Que en todo Estados Unidos se oiga nuestra voz y que este sueño americano sea una realidad. ¡No! I'm going to start off with uh, something we've heard before. History will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period of social transition was not the strident clamor of bad people, in this case politicians, but the appalling silence of the good people, and Martin Luther King said that. And here on council, we're looking at this wall and it is so bad in so many places. Where? Yeah. So many places. Where? It spits in the face of our neighbor. It, it slaps our yeah. face. I will address you in my la later on. I will address you. And so it is not good for our city. It is not good for our environment. It is not good for any of us and it'll have a lasting long effect on the way we live around here. Amen. Now, I want to close by saying this, and this will address you. Nothing, and this is Martin Luther King who said this, nothing in all the world is more dangerous than the sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. to come out and speak. These students are students from high schools and Tammy U, and they want to share a little bit about why they came here today to participate in our march and to see why this is important to them. I knew that I was going to come try myself, I was going to come and like walk this march. 
My name is Brandon Caceres. I'm an uh, I'm a migrant that usually goes to up north to Wisconsin, and I'm very glad to be a part of my organization, Sessions Chavez Memorial Alliance (CCMA). <laughs> I'm 
I'm glad to see a lot, so many familiar faces, people all around. I'm glad to be part of uh, another march for this year. And I would like to give a word out to family. I would like to give out a word to my mom that uh, she's been a real encouragement to everything within part of my family, keeping everything up straight. Um, where's my mom? Uh, I just saw her. Oh, there she is. A round of applause to each of your parents, everybody who made it here today, and I'm really proud to see everybody still fighting uh, for uh, Trump's ignorance and keeping to persist uh, uh, from building the border wall. Also, I would like to notice um, a factual piece of uh, information. If Trump's promises would be very uh, persistent, how would he even build the wall? On the river? Uh, in which side of, uh, of the borders? It'd be very impossible to even build the wall. Anyway. Oh, you want no border? No! No border at all! No border at all! It's not possible! If he's gonna build a wall, he's building on property, and that's against human rights. Who's with me? A border is not even possible. You can't build it on the river, it weathers away. It's not even possible to build walls on the river. And that is all, thank you. Yeah, we have one last uh, student speaker and then we're gonna wrap up with the final speaker. Good morning guys, my name is Dana Moreno. I'm sorry if my voice is a little hoarse, I was yelling a lot. Um, I am a senior at Garcia Early College High School and I want to share with you guys a little bit of my resume so that I can get my point across clear and simple. At school I'm a part of student council, I'm a part of the superintendent's advisory council, I've been district champion for rotary clubs, I've started an interact club and I consider myself a huge pioneer for a lot of students that come to the United States. But here's the biggest defining factor about me, I was an undocumented immigrant for the longest time because I came to the United States when I was too young and I didn't know much about what the process of immigration was and neither did my mother. Thanks to Ms. Nani Villalma, I was able to gain a pathway to residency, and so now I'm a legal resident, and it's been four years ago. Um, I don't know if this is the right thing to say, but I'd like to share really quick uh, my story, and that is that I had to live about 14 of my years in hiding because it goes back to the same thing. I was afraid that one day going to school would mean that when I got home, my mother would be gone and that I wouldn't have a place to live and that I wouldn't have anybody there to support me. I became very shy. Uh, I didn't interact with anybody at school and I felt that my only way to really succeed was just to get by. And if I managed to get into any college that was already surpassing any sort of expectations and limitations. However, gaining that residency and seeing all these people in this wonderful community that support people like me and my background has made me come out of my shell and I'm able to stand in front of you guys today and more importantly I'm able to stand in front of a banner and support the ideas that are humane, the ideas that push for the freedom for everybody, the human rights for everybody and more importantly to stop the segregation of people from my community and all around the world. It goes back to the same thing, I'm sorry English is my second language but um, in Spanish I would love to say que todas las personas que están aquí son mi familia porque he crecido de este lado de del río entonces este es mi hogar y quisiera que todas las personas que estuvieran aquí supieran que con todo mi corazón los bendigo y les digo que muchas gracias por estar aquí y soportar la causa gracias okay. Okay. You guys, really wonderful. We love you guys. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have one last speaker and then we'll be done. Uh, and I want to close it up quickly because these young people down here have been holding the sign for more than an hour. And when I asked them to volunteer, they had no idea what their commitment was gonna be. Sorry guys, okay? So Vale, we gotta end it quickly, okay? Our last speaker is Vale. He spoke at our, at our silent sit-in last month and he like blew us all away. And so I, I welcome him to come back on the stage to share his very strong message. Uh, thank you. I wanna give, I wanna recognize the diverse melting pot of human beings that are here among us today. 
I see people from Germany, beautiful people from Switzerland. I see Arabs. I see Jews. I see Mexicans who are also Native American. Just look at my map right here. They're all Americans. And when, when I sing the national anthem and God bless America, I mean it. My name is Valentin Ruiz. I'm a veteran, a scout sniper with JSOC. I was a member, proud member, and honored member of the elite. As a scout sniper, I got trained $1.2 million in my training. Therefore, I feel strongly that there is no national emergency or danger in our border. This is not Katrina. There is no martial law here. Like my daughter sign says, where is where is the emergency? <laughs> Laredo, Texas is the safest city, one of the safest cities in the nation. <laughs> and we live in the border with no wall. Yes. Thanks to the Border Patrol, the Highway Patrol, U.S. Customs, the Sheriff's Department, our constable, and Laredo PD, where are you at? Thank you. This border is not a war zone. I see some people from New York here. Where are you? Where are you? I saw some people from New York. But what I want to say here about New York is when people fly in into the United States to see the great Statue of Liberty, to them, they arrive home. As a soldier, when you come back to the United States and they fly by the great Statue of Liberty, you feel like at home. But for me, yes, it felt good. But I didn't feel that I was home until I saw my international bridge, and my river, and my people. And I'll be damned if this jerk defaces my Statue of Liberty with Constantine, a wire, and a wall of hate. I learned the art of war. And it saddens me because in order for you to have war, you have to dehumanize a people the way they dehumanize our Native Americans, my brothers and sisters, and said they were savages. The Aztecs, the Mexica, the Israeli people, when they put them in concentration camps, they gave their white nationalist nation fear of them, of us. They criminalize them. They make walls against, I'm sorry, they make laws against refugees in order to call them criminals. They give them anger. They say that they're gonna take away their jobs and their schools. They're gonna get free schooling. What's so? What's so awful about people wanting to work to make a living or want to educate themselves? Their hate causes shootings in El Paso. And it can happen here. Mexico is not our enemy. They are our allies. They are our brothers. They are our sisters. They are mothers, they are our 
fathers, their families. Just think about it. Our soldiers got attacked from Iran because they were right next door. Our enemy wants to move into Mexico and Trump's hatred is going to open that door for him where the Russians could move in, where other countries that want to defeat us can move into Mexico or Canada. We need to remain friendly with the Mexican people, with America. Trump's desire for a wall is only to appease his white nationalist base because they fear the white genocide. My white friends, mis amigos, los I love you. I don't hate you. And if anybody wants to create a genocide against you, I will stand with you. And all of these Laredoans will stand with you. They have a fear that all the immigrants are going to be Democrats. <laughs> Guys, when you vote for a president or the mayor, Democrat or Republican, after the deal is done, we're all Americans. <laughs> Trump said that Mexicans are, again, Mexicans, rapists, and murderers. They want to use that as fear for their people. They want to use people of color like AOC against us. I heard people from the Union of the Border Patrol, they posted against us because UISD was kind enough to pass out our flyers because you, you students are Americans and you have a right to choose whether you want to attend or not. Nobody forced you to be here. You have that freedom. We're in America, and they were saying that they were doing wrong. But yet, they have a platform every time they visit the school in career days, and they speak up about how much they want their wall. The white nationalists want you to fear the Democrats and Bernie Sanders, and the lady who is a Muslim who just got voted for. After the elections, as I stated, we're all Americans. Henry Cuellar, he raised money for Republicans. I have nothing against Republicans. But let me tell you this, he raised millions of dollars for them. And where the hell are they? Onde esta la esquina? Why are they not here fighting? against the border wall with us if Henry Gray had raised millions of dollars for them. Where are they? Our mayor laid out the red carpet for Trump when he was running. He was kind, he was generous, and he told him he was going to be safe. If not, he wasn't going to get off the airplane or the limousine. Okay, what do you expect with a coward with a bone spur? <laughs> Yet, Trump labeled us as a sanctuary city in order to please his white nationalist people and he denied us millions of dollars for infrastructure in our border. Why? Because if you can see, we're predominantly more Hispanic and yes, we're a blue dot, we're Democrats, majority of us. And it is not true, we are not a sanctuary city. Ever since I was a little child, I have seen families been separated, mothers taken away from the help of the LPD, from the help of the Sheriff's Department. So we're not a sanctuary city, it's just a lie. He claimed last time that I heard him speak that, uh, well, the powers of be and all this, you know what? Ya es tiempo que nuestro mayor le hable a Chile y le diga que no quiere el muro aquí. He doesn't deserve any respect. I'm glad that you students came here to educate yourselves. 
I'm happy that we have some Trump supporters that were quiet and respectful and heard our side of the picture. Yesterday I was saddened because uh, this Border Patrol Union group was uh, spreading a lot of white nationalist propaganda, mentioning AOC, that we stand for with AOC. How many of us can vote for AOC? She's not, she's not even from our area. You know, they were just spreading that white propaganda. We are Americans, and we decide for ourselves whether we shoot, choose the wall or not. This is our fight. Who are we? Who are we? We're human beings. In mi raza, los tejanos, we embrace Tejano music, which came from the German polkas and the Polish polkas. You made it with us. We're going to close with a prayer by our Lakota brother. And so um, today's event, you know, it was about having you here and about getting the message out and about growing in strength and numbers and lifting our voices to get our message and make it loud and clear. Just so you know, the amount of miles that they are proposing for our community, it's 124 for Webb and Zapata in total. Each mile right now costs $24.4 million to build for one mile. When you multiply that by 124, what they want to invest one contractor will benefit for Web and Zapata. They want to spend three billion taxpayer dollars to build a wall in our community. They've made decisions without asking us, and they're going to take a lot of land, private and public land, to do this. And we cannot allow that. This deeply unjust, undemocratic process. One of the most egregious land grabs and chapters in our border history. So we thank you for being here, understanding that there's so many reasons why so many of us are involved in this and are against this. Environmental, immigration, lack of due process, the mathematical illogic of building something that will solve no problems and will just create more problems. And they didn't involve us.